Hey guys, it's Tom Box here. Welcome to part two of the Flames of Destruction full set analysis. In the part two, of course, we are talking about the new archetypes, major supports. So in other words, in this video, we're going to be talking about, of course, nightmares. We're going to be talking about the element sabers. We got Altergeist in there, even though Altergeist only got a couple of cards in there. That one card hits the sweet spot of tilting it over the scale. And then we have two of the TCG exclusives. We have the Avengers and we have the FA and that's all going to be wrapped up in this video. And in the third part, we're going to be talking about the underrated cards and all the other ones that got minor support and just archetype updates. Now, if you haven't seen the first part of talking about all the secret rares and price points that they'll probably settle at, uh, you can definitely check it out in the description down below or probably just in the video links like somewhere over there. All right, just a quick little plug here. If you guys want to help support this channel, it's a lot of hard work putting all this stuff together and doing all this research. You guys can help support this channel, help it grow stronger, improve some of the equipment, improve some of the tech by checking out the Patreon link below. And of course, you guys get perk and access to some of the exclusive stuff in Patreon. A lot of stuff I usually don't share, but I will share with my Patreons. Anyways, let's go. So to kick off this uh, new archetype, we got the Nightmares. This is the one that 90% of you guys are really hyped for and can't wait to shove most of these Link monsters into your extra deck so that you get a nice versatile toolbox. And I don't blame you because they are very powerful. Now this archetype is shared with the World Legacy, which is why I kind of included them in here. They're just part of all the same narrative, the World Chalice, the Mech Knights, a little X-Crawlers. Who cares about X-Crawlers? And then there is, of course, the Nightmare now. Now, Nightmare Griffin, and before I actually talk about the links themselves, all the Link monsters, they carry multiple effects. One is the on-Link Summon effect, which possibly will help you gain some form of advantage, but it does carry a discard cost that can be mitigated by them being co-linked. If they are co-linked upon Summon, you get to draw a card afterwards. So in other words, you throw a card, draw a card, basically it's a free plus or a free activation of their effect. And they all kind of have an effect where if they are co-linked or something is co-linked on the field, they get some sort of effect. Uh, however, Griffin is a special case. Now, if I read Griffin and all the recipes are the same, they just require two monsters with different names, which is very easy. This Link 4 monster acts as a spell or trap retrieval out of the graveyard and sets it straight onto the field upon Link Summon. And uh, unlike Demok, I guess you can't really activate that card right away, but if you get like a trap, like a Solemn Judgment or something like that, you can really keep your opponent at bay, which is why this is actually the second most expensive card probably in this entire set. I guess it could depend on whether or not Unicorn's more versatile and more people will actually want Unicorn, but Unicorn and Griffin, both of them are quite up there because they're very versatile cards in general for the extra deck. Now, aside from like retrieving a spell and trap, this monster is a floodgate monster. Reading the card text here, special summon monster cannot activate their effects except linked monster. By linked monster, I'm not saying link monster. Linked, as long as your monster has an arrow pointing to it, it is linked. So if you have a regular link monster with an arrow and then you have another normal monster beside it or just any type of monster that's not a link monster, just quickly giving you the rules here, both of them are considered link monster. It's either you're pointing to something or you're being point to. That's when you consider it as a link. Now bear in mind that Griffin does point upwards. So in other words, your opponent is basically guaranteed at least one form of link uh, available so that they actually can still activate at least one effect. So you can't just fully floodgate them out. So this card is actually gonna be a bit pricey. It's going to be probably about 30 to 40 dollars. Uh, even when it's settled because it's a floodgate S monster and that usually determines uh, certain cards price points. It's gonna be a bit of a pricier one. Now next up we have the Nightmare Corruptor Ibli. Now Ibli is a kind of an interesting choice. Not everyone's choosing to run Ibli, not from what I've seen uh, in OCG. I guess some people are finding it more favorable because it feels like a debris dragon for Link monsters. You summon her out and then immediately you can target one of your Link monsters in the graveyard and special summon it while linked to her. So it has to point to her. That's basically what it says. And when she's sent to the graveyard, you can special summon this card to your opponent's side of the field in defense mode. Now she does have a condition where when she is on the field, the con I guess the player that can controls her cannot do any kind of special summon except like summon. So you got to get rid of the thing. But because she can revive any form of link monster, you can revive higher links to go into, say, you take a three, you can go through home to a four very easily. And that's why she's also a secret rare, but I don't think her demand is as high. But she is a waifu card. I mean, she's looking very pretty. Look at all those beautiful colors, those gemstones flying around her. I think she's a, she's definitely one that's going to be like 24. 
five to thirty dollars at the moment, and perhaps even higher if the people decide to actually run her like more frequently. But I don't see her staying up at that point for very long. But she is going to be something that if you do run, you might not even need a playset. So there you have it. And as for the last secret, the last secret that was finally released we have or just i guess we get a sneak peek of it which is nightmare unicorn nightmare unicorn is a link 3 i believe everyone should actually have this card in their extra deck simply for the fact that upon link summoning you can discard one card of course and then target a uh, card on the field okay it does target not exactly the best thing against like uh, i guess target immune cards but if you do get to like target a card you get to shuffle that card back into the deck so it, it removes the threat without the possibility of triggering something remember stuff getting shuffled back into the deck usually cannot trigger it, even if they're just removed from the field think about uh what's that uh, reborn tengu if you shuffle reborn tengu back into the deck it will not trigger and uh, of course, if it's co link, of course, you get to draw a card. Now, bear in mind that if you do have co link nightmare monsters, you get to draw cards instead of performing your normal draw phase. So, if you actually have a bunch of co linked nightmare monsters, instead of drawing one card for your turn draw, if you got two of them set up, you get to draw four cards, which is, I think, pretty nasty, pretty disgusting. But uh, that means you actually have to get that set up. So it's actually not that easy. But at least if you get to perform one co-link on uh, Unicorn, then you at least get to draw two cards rather than your standard one, which is like a pot of greed. Turning your turns into pot of greed, who doesn't want that? Sadly, it's a secret rare, so you can expect this card to be about 25 to 30 and probably staying around there because it is so generic and it acts as a threat removal. It doesn't really hurt to actually play this card. Especially if you have cards that you can actually ditch into the graveyard to synergize, like a glow ball, for instance. Yeah, this card is definitely one card that you should care about. Going down to the ultra rares, now we have Nightmare Goblin. As a Link 2, uh, he is very versatile and definitely one of the more unique monsters. So far, the Link 2s have been just anchors to get into plays, and somehow this one is more of like a combo chain because upon Link summoning, you can discard a card and you can apply this effect. So this is a full trigger and. Uh, if it was Cold Link, of course, you get to draw one card. Now, once the effect is applied, basically during your main phase this turn, so I guess you only get this additional summon once, uh, you can normal summon uh, one monster into like an arrow it points to. So you get an additional normal summon on this turn. Now, as for the protection, neither players can target Cold Link monsters. As an ultra rare, I can see this card probably being about $5 or even $10, depending on how frequent it is played. It is comparable to Seraph Knight to some degree, where you get an extra normal summon. Especially when you get an arrow pointing down, then you summon out the Nightmare Goblin, then you get an additional normal summon. I can see ABC players perhaps trying to abuse this a bit more. And I think it's actually pretty damn useful, especially when it comes to the discard cost, where you can actually throw out an ABC piece and kind of play around it and don't forget most of these guys they share a recipe of just two monsters with different names and that's actually very easy if especially if you run scapegoat uh, that just gives you additional summons just by playing scapegoat so let's quickly go over the next two ultra rares they're both spell cards one's world legacy inheritor and the other is nightmare now inheritor basically is when you control a link monster or if you have a link arrow pointing to somewhere you control uh, you get the special summon a monster from your graveyard to that zone Luckily, this card does not specify and what kind of monster you can revive. So you can revive basically anything, but that's just like Reborn. And Reborn right now currently is still unbanned as of making of this video. So this is just like a weaker version of Monster Reborn. But if you want to run more copies, well, there you have it. You have your options. If you do play a lot of links, this is definitely one way you can definitely abuse that card, uh, like Reborn. And the next card is World Legacy Nightmare. This is the field spell that usually every single uh, archetype of World Legacy usually gets. Um, Nightmare is kind of a silly one, I think. It's just position changing. If you can take one of your Nightmare monsters and shift it around, that's I think that's all it does. You can actually switch two of them, or you can move one to another zone that you control. Basically, you just move stuff. And uh, if you do control this card, your Colink monsters don't take battle damage. So it's very simple. Not a card that you probably want to go heavy into. It's kind of pointless. The artwork is kind of messy. I guess they're going to go on a full charge right now. I guess, uh, well, good luck fighting them all off, I suppose. Whoever that's in there. And down to the super rares. Of course, these two monsters are both Link 2s that you should probably get. Uh, they are Nightmare Phoenix and Nightmare Cerberus. Phoenix acts as a spell trap removal, also carrying a 1900 body upon 
Link Summoning. Uh, you get to discard a card and then pop a spell trap that your opponent controls. Specifically your opponent, so you can't pop your own in case you were wondering if you were stuck under your own Floodgate. Now, all Colink monsters cannot be destroyed by battle, which is a pretty damn good effect. But seeing that you're already 19 beat stick, you should be okay for the most part. Uh, definitely shove one of these into your extra deck just because it's like having a tornado dragon in there It's just more useful to actually have one than not the arrows. It does point up and left uh, Up and sorry not left but uh, up and right So it's not exactly a link monster you can open with but if you're playing brandish maidens You don't really care because you're just gonna shove it up there anyway Then we have Cerberus Cerberus not as useful as Phoenix it does destroy a card on the field. It destroys a special summon monster that's in your opponent's main monster zone. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part because it's very specific. So it's not as like versatile in terms of utility. So this might not be the one monster that you would actually put in there if you need to monster pop. It's not like Break Sword, which can pop anything. But your co-link monsters, on the other hand, cannot be destroyed by card effects. So you might be going for this one for more of the protection effect more than anything else. But of course, these are super rares. Don't worry about price point. And then we have World Legacy Echo. I believe this is Suffering. I believe this is the counter trap. If you have a Colink monster, you get to negate a monster spell or trap. Basically, it's like a uh, ultimate providence of of the World Legacy. So if you have a Colink monster, you just get to negate everything. Now into the co commons and rares. Starting off with your rare Link One. This is the one that you can start everything off with. It requires one Nightmare monster, so this one is actually not generic. But if this card is Link Summon, you can discard a card, special summon a Nightmare from the deck, which gets you Ibli because Ibli is the only monster you can actually get out. And uh, if it was Colink, of course you get to draw a card. And you can only use this effect once per turn, but you can actually make all monsters on field lose 1,000 attack and defense, uh, except for Colink monsters. Yeah, so pretty simple stuff here. And let's move on to the spells and traps. We have World Legacy Awakening, basically emergency uh, linking. You just uh, activate it and they immediately link summon something. So this is like uh, urgent tuning or something like that. Next, we have uh, resistance. So for every Colink you have, you destroy spells and traps equal to the co-link, so pretty simple. Now, World Legacy World Lance. This monster is quite the funny one. It has a 3k body, which is pretty awesome, okay? I'll give him that. And he's also a hand trap. If you battle with at least a link monster in there, if there's a link monster within the battle, you can actually use this as a hand trap, discard the card, and uh, your opponent loses 3,000 attack. So you can basically run over most monsters pretty easily. And if a monster is special summoned from the extra deck, uh, special summon one world legacy token, zero zero in each player's field in defense position. Kind of funny, and of course he's an attack magnet as well. But And then we have Avram, we already have this card, he came out as a super uh, in our special eds. And world legacy end, I guess this is the end of the story. Uh, once per turn, if a phase of Link monster you control is destroyed by battle or leaves the field because of your opponent's card effect, in other words, your opponent gets rid of something, uh, special summon one world legacy monster from your hand or deck in defense position. So this is actually a pretty good generic card overall. It doesn't specifically target world legacy monster, but world legacy world chalice is quite the monster that can actually set up multiple combos. So uh, overall, world legacy end actually benefits world chalice quite uh, a bit as well so you know you have that option so if you actually want to play a full world legacy deck this is definitely perhaps one of the cards that you want to have access to and the last new archetype being introduced in flames of destruction we have element sabers or elemental lords they're the sub archetype of elemental lords anyways kind of like the monarchs had the squires the elemental lords they have the element sabers yeah. Okay, while I was filming this, I just realized something that the entire archetype of element lords and element sabers are just copies of effects that are pretty useful other Yu-Gi-Oh cards. That's how it works. See, element lords, they all have more broken effects or like kind of on the higher tier end of spells and trap and mix. So we have Moulin Glacier that copies Delinquent Duel basically. We have Force Rage right now that simulates Red Geki. We have Windrose that simulate Heavy Storm. We have Powder Rex as a Ring of Destruction. And we have Grand Soil simulating a Monster Reborn. They all kind of simulate those effects. So kind of neat. But I also realized that all the Element Savers, they also simulate effects in that regard. Very similarly, just not as busted. So they got more of the utility cards over 
the uh, the busted uh, like one-off cards that were one, at one point on the ban list. So starting off with our element sabers. Now bear in mind that all the element sabers can change their attributes except for the high-level ones uh, in the graveyard, so they can facilitate the summoning conditions of the elemental lords. So. Uh, Makani here is the wind type, and uh, once per turn, you can send an element saber from your hand to the graveyard and add an element saber or element lord monster from the deck to the hand. So overall, this is your Stratos and with a matching attribute as well. Uh, overall, okay, it's a decent monster. These are not hard ones per turn, from what I can see. Yeah, they are not hard ones per turn. So you can, uh, uh, as you summon more and more, you can actually reactivate their effects. So bear that in mind. So they are all warrior, so you're definitely gonna want to run Rhoda in this. And I guess this is a Rhoda to some degree. Next Ultra Rare, we have Malehu. So you already have your Synergy, your Consistency Searcher, which is Makani. Now you have Malehu. This is a Book of Moon. You just send one Element Saber from your hand to the grave, and you can target a face of monster on the field and change the defense. This card is going to be very useful in the mirror match if you do play this deck, because uh, you'll soon see that uh, Eula or Willa, I already forgot what's her name, Willa La Mana or whatever, or what you guys may know as uh, Williard. Yeah, he's gonna be offering a lot of protection. This is actually kind of a helmet -y deck, to be honest, if you actually get to the point where you establish like four monsters on the board. I don't see you losing that badly because it's actually very hard to clear all these monsters. But yeah, Malehu is your Book of Moon, also your strongest beat stick. He is the one that carries the attribute of Dark, which makes sense for Book of Moon. But here's one of the most important cards, and I think this one is actually the money card of this particular archetype. It is the Palace of the Elemental Lords. So this card acts as a once per turn Rota, so very similar to Spiral Resort, but they did the right thing in this one. They actually make you skip the battle phase of your next turn if you do activate this card, simply because it kind of shares the, uh, I guess, the restraint of an Elemental Lord. If an Elemental Lord is removed from the field, you cannot go into your battle phase in the next turn. This is, I guess, a very similar case to that. So you get to add an element saber monster from the deck to hand, which is pretty good. But here's the attack boost that makes everything kind of hard to beat down. All monsters you control gain 200 attack and defense for each different attribute among them in the graveyard. Note that if you start manipulating your graveyard, you're going to lose that attack because if you're trying to summon out an, an elemental lord, you're going to have to change five of your monsters into one attribute. So at least you get the 200 boost if you change all five. Okay, but once per turn, if... An element saber monster you control or in your hand would activate an effect by sending cards from the hand to the graveyard. You can send an element saber monster, bracket S, plural as well, from your deck to the graveyard. Essentially turning your entire deck into a foolish burial through one field spell. How far? This is only once per turn, but it's still a huge deal because it acts as a rota and it also acts as a foolish burial. And when these cards are both limited to one, you guys kind of get the idea of how this deck kind of gets going. But it is an ultra rare. I would say this is like a $10 to $15 ultra rare. Of course, this archetype isn't exactly very popular. It's not at the tier of meta, but I can see you guys getting cheesed out by this deck just simply because of the fact of this particular monster, which we will talk to in a bit. It's Willyard here, but I believe the name that we actually get now is called... Uh, uh, Eula, Eula Mana or something. But back to the next Ultra Rare first, let's talk about Element Training. Element Training is a very, very powerful trap card that if they get this on the field, it, not only does it protect the, the Palace of the Elemental Lords, you cannot target with the card effects and it cannot be destroyed by card effects. So the field spell is here to stay. You know that this is a very field spell heavy archetype, so very, be very careful with this because if you lose your field spell, you're not going to be able to pay costs. And the best way to actually stop this deck is to prevent you from actually getting there. But what does this offer? Basically, once per turn you can tribute a monster and then you can special summon an element saber monster from the deck uh, with a different attribute. And that's just once per turn. But it also carries another effect in the late game. You can actually send this card to the graveyard and uh, guess what? Discard your entire hand and then add an elemental lord or actually the lords from your graveyard to your hand equal to the number of cards you have discarded. And uh, yeah, that just means here comes a barrage of bosses that's about to actually wreck face. You're gonna lose two cards, maybe you'll lose your entire back row. Basically, you're just about to lose a bunch of stuff. And uh, that's kind of how it plays out. But you, this is not exactly the play style of the deck. We'll go into the play style of the deck very shortly when we go into the super rares. And onto the super rares, I hate to say this, but for Siraj, the Elemental Lord is a super rare. You know what? You're not cool, man. You ruined everything. 
of all your rarity. You should have been a secret if anything. It would have made a lot more sense if you were a secret like your others. But no, you decide to be a super, not even an ultra man. Not even an ultra. But yes, this is Raigeki with legs. Uh, five light monsters in the graveyard to summon. That's it. That's all I have to talk about him. Of course, if he leaves the field, you get to uh, skip your next battle phase. Or skip the next battle phase of your next turn. Now we have Element Saber Williard. Or I think this is, uh, let's just call him uh, William Mana. Because I think that's the actual name. Now for William Mana, we have send two monsters from your hand to the grave. And special summon this card from your hand. Now depending on the Element Saber's attribute you send to the grave, you offer protection to your entire board of Element Sabers and Element Lords. The protection, this is why the deck is kind of considered a helmet because you actually just turn all your monsters into like masterpiece level protection. So depending on the matchup, you can actually kind of flex it up a bit. Uh, so we have Earth and Wind that protects you from being destroyed by battle, which is a bit more useful in this particular mirror match. And then you have Water and Fire, which is cannot be destroyed by card effects. If you have both, a water monster and an earth monster or like a wind and a fire you are in protected from basically all forms of destruction card effect destruction and battle destruction so the only way that your, your opponent can actually do anything against you is to use a compulsory evacuation device to bounce it back to your hand stuff like that but normally what i would see people do is they would go for like a dark monster or a light monster and a water and fire so that you're protected from all forms of targeting and you cannot be destroyed by card effects. So in other words, you can mainly be destroyed by battle, but with the temple, it becomes a bit more difficult because with the temple uh, or the palace of the elemental lords, the field spell is going to offer you a crap ton of stats. Right, right now, looking at our current monster, he's at 24, but just by simply activating his effect to summon out, uh, through the field spell, you are automatically going to be throwing in two monsters into the graveyard. If you throw a water and a light, then you're already good to go. You are at 28, cannot be destroyed by card effects, and cannot be targeted. This body is going to live. If you put one more monster in there, then now he's like basically at uh, 3k? Is it 3k? Yeah, I think he's at 3k. Yeah, so this is going to be a very sticky monster. But now all your elemental lords are also protected. So if you start spamming big dudes on the field, it's very difficult to clear because of the protection that this monster offers. Now, if you manage to actually put two of these guys on the field, then uh, yeah, good luck breaking the board. So I hope you have a uh, Winged Dragon Ross Sphere Mode or some form of Kaiju to uh, take away one form of protection. Now the light monster here is a bit of a new guy. He's kind of like a downgrade of this dude. I guess you can really say this is the knight in shining armor, the paladin of sorts. Now this guy is also a protection based card. Uh, when a spell or trap card is activated, he has a quick effect to send an element saber from your hand to the graves or from the deck if you have the field spell, negate the spell and trap. So if you have this guy on the field, you get additional levels of protection. So if it's a really big threat, like a dark hole regeki evenly matched, this is the guy you want there to take care of that problem. Now, Nalu is just Graveyard Retrieval. Yeah, that's it. Super rare Graveyard Retrieval. Very similar to Makani in some sense. If you send from the uh, deck to the grave and then you just target the same card, you kind of just fetch the card, but you can't get the Elemental Lords, so, so that's your limitation. Now, onto the commons. Aina is a Monster Reborn, I guess. It's kind of like a Monster Reborn, but she can also revive Elemental Lords because she can ignore the summoning conditions of Elemental Lords. Bear in mind that this is just a ruling refresher for all of you guys. Nomi monsters, such as monsters that cannot be special summoned except for their own summoning condition, but then when there are cards that use like ignoring summoning condition, if they cannot normally be like special summoned or whatever, and uh, they have a very specific summoning condition, bear in mind that you actually have to summon them out correctly first before actually summoning them out especially if it's coming from the graveyard or the banish pile. If it's coming from the banish or coming from graveyard, you have to summon it out correctly at least once before you actually get to revive them. So Aina is kind of a lackluster card in my opinion, but she can be useful as like tethering your combo together. So if you do have like a Makani in the graveyard and you need to get the Makani to get the additional search, this is the card to get, to get there. Malo is your Foolish Burial. So in other words, you get a double Foolish with this, with a Field Spell, and uh, it really synergizes up your, your combo plays coming up. 
But yeah, that's basically the element sabers all wrapped up in a nutshell. I've done another video about them, how to play them, like how to do your turn one Mulan Glacier so you can give your opponent a hard time, stuff like that. You can still check it out. And uh, if you do manage to put out double of this monster, that is what you should be aiming for for this deck anyway, because it becomes a very painful process to actually break the board. Now moving away from new archetypes, we're going to go into the major support and the one deck that everyone's kind of been looking for to play or they've already stocked up on all those cards, the Altergeist, mainly because Multifaker is being released. Now, what happened previously with the Altergeist deck is they were too slow. They were lacking the ability to put multiple monsters on the field. Their trap lineup seems very strong. One basically acting as an infinite divine wrath, a once per turn kind of deal, and the other card is... Um, I guess I call the haunted so you can revive stuff and you can retrieve your trap So a lot of them have good synergy in the graveyard They can obviously replenish themselves off you a good level of recovery But this is the card they were missing the whole deck was lacking summoning It was very difficult to put multiple monsters on the field and maintaining those traps was like a nightmare but multi faker takes care of all of that not only does she special summon herself out she acts as Ice Spell. She special summons another monster with her. And that actually makes Silkitis one of the most live monsters available. Now on top of that, let's talk about Infinite Impermanence for a second. It can be activated from the hand. And if you activate Infinite Impermanence from the hand, that means you activated a trap card. That means Multifaker can come out. And if Multifaker can come out, it means you get access to Silkitis. And uh, Silkatus is going to be able to bounce one card your opponent controls. You can bounce back this multi-faker back to your hand to bounce one of your, your opponent's cards. So in other words, not only did you get a negation on the turn that's not even yours, say turn one, you're going second, you get to bounce a card and negate a card if you have infinite impermanence, which is why this card or this deck is actually uh, partly relying on that too. And don't forget, Melusik is a very good card. Sorry for the guys in Europe, but uh, Link Karibo does make her a much better card here in NA, simply because of the fact that if this card's sent to the graveyard from the field, you can add an Altergeist monster to your hand. And one easy add is this, Multi Faker. Now, Multi Faker is probably going to be an expensive ultra rare. I would assume it is a three of right now, and it's going to be around $15 to $20 per copy. And I can actually imagine it's staying up that way because if this deck comes in, like uh, kicks into the metagame and it is actually having a huge impact, we're going to see some pretty nasty things. And this, the prices are just going to skyrocket. Even the prices of this monster has already skyrocketed. Melusik, Mr. Meeseek, has already been skyrocketed to like 10 bucks a copy, 10 to 15 a copy right now. So uh, definitely really hyped up thanks to Multi Faker. Now on top of that, there's also other common cards and rare cards in here. So we get another Link monster. We have uh, uh, Kidolga. Kidolga, I think, is a stealer. I believe this one steals your opponent's monster. When other Altergeist monster inflicts battle damage to your opponent, target one monster your opponent's graveyard, special summon it to the, uh, I guess, uh, I guess to one of her pointers, and um, it cannot attack unless this card declared an attack. In other words, if you already attacked your opponent, then well, have fun because you get a free monster and you get another free swing. In other words, this is one of those damage pushers because the Altergeist deck isn't exactly known for pushing out big damage at the moment, uh, but this definitely helps mitigate that. And it is a link too, so it's easy access whatsoever. You can actually start with her or you can like put her as a part of the combo because she does have good arrows pointing left. I guess the left is this way in, in the camera and down, so it's pretty decent. We also have uh, Emulate Elf, which acts as just a trap monster. It's also carrying the Altergeist name. Uh, but when this monster is on the field, uh, your traps you control cannot be destroyed by card effects and they cannot be targeted by uh, either player. So, okay, well, that's actually pretty good. Good protection. If you actually put two of these onto the field, then you have yourselves a nice uh, protection lock so that you both your emulate elf are protected but why do you, would you want to actually do that i don't know and by the way they're all spell casters so if you do have the um spell book of knowledge you can send them to the graveyard for draws especially you melusik and there's also another monster you have pixel pixel is execute the top three cards and add the altergeist card to your hand i guess that's it nothing really else to talk about this this is kind of like a meh card the only card we really care about is multi faker 
Okay, now we're moving on to the TCG exclusives. Let's start with Vendrids, the spawn archetype. Now this one here, Executor, is the new ritual monster being added up. All these monsters are rare, so I'm not gonna talk about price points because you easily can acquire all these cards. Some of these cards are more notable than others, but as for the ones that I don't know much about, I'm just gonna make jokes with them. Starting with this one, Executor, it's... Well, his name becomes Revenge's Slayer while on the field, so I'm guessing this isn't even my final form. Look at him, all that tentacles. He looks like he's going through like a Bankai phase. If you guys watch Bleach, maybe you guys don't watch Bleach, but anyways, I'm running out of anime references for this guy, but okay, so he is a bit of a targeting magnet when he's yelling out his Bankai or transforming. Everyone's just gonna target him now because he is the center of attention. Now, on top of that, if this ritual summon card is destroyed by battle or destroyed by your opponent's card effect while you control this card, or like if you were the controller, uh, add one Vendrick card from the deck to the hand. Okay, that's fair enough. I don't think that's that good, but I don't play Vendrids. Maybe you guys can educate me on this one. As for the next monster, we have Vendred Anima. Anima is another fodder monster that has, well, the ability to actually uh, banish this card from the grave or target one of your banished Vendred monsters, except for Vendred Anima. Special summon it. You also cannot special summon anything except for zombie monsters this turn. Okay, fair enough. But a Vendred monster that uses this card on the field gains the following effect. Okay. Any, monst any monster that gets destroyed by battle from your ritual monster gets banished. Okay, so in other words, it's just overall, um, it makes all your attacks much safer. There's less repercussions, especially coming from the effects that trigger in the graveyard. Overall, pretty decent, giving your monster a bit more battle threat. And since people aren't exactly running mirror forces and stuff like that, it's going to go through and it's going to be very, very deadly. Yeah, well, that is... I believe you can also revive the ritual monsters as well, especially if they have already been summoned properly once. So I guess there's a I guess there's a plus to that. But she doesn't have any stats, so that's just one thing to bear in mind. I don't know how good this card is. You guys, let me know. Now we have Vendor Evolution, the transformation. It's like ah, 20 episodes later, and then you'll transform. But this one is actually kind of reminding me of Necros a little bit, mainly because you get to use your deck as uh, the material. I guess uh, for Necros, it was Kaleidoscope, you get to use your extra deck to send stuff. This one, you actually get to send one Vendred monster from your deck to the graveyard, whose total level equals to the ritual monster being summoned. And uh, you have, But you do have to destroy that monster during the end phase of the next turn. So in other words, it stays on the field for about one more turn. Okay, that's fine. And Vendred Nightmare, the card that everyone said is a waste of artwork. The artwork is like a sure you can... And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't carry a very good effect, which is you contribute one or more of your Vengeance monsters in your hand or on the field to target one monster you control. Increase its level by the numbers of tributed until the end of the turn. That's it. It's a level manipulator. When you're attacking Vendred, Ritual Monster destroys a monster by battle, you can have your monster gain a thousand attacks. So is there a double attack here or something? Am I missing something? What would you actually use this card for? But I think you can technically abuse that tribute effect. Tribute one or more of your Vendred monsters. Eh, I guess you kind of throw them into the graveyard if that's what you're aiming for. I don't, but it doesn't even perform a ritual summon, so it's like kind of mad to me. If this performed a ritual summon on top, that'd be pretty nice. Now, this is the card that I actually kind of want to bring attention to. It's Vendred Daybreak. If your opponent's playing Vendred, you should be very careful and skeptical whether or not they actually have this card in the back row. If your opponent controls more cards than you do, choose one ritual monster, ritual summon Vendred monster you control. Destroy all cards on the field except for the chosen monster. Um... I don't know about you, but this is just Excited Knight in a card form. Yeah, I guess to blow up all your cards. You can only use one Daybreak per turn, which is okay, fair, a bit more fair. But being able to wipe your entire board? Uh, I think you're about to die, to be honest. Because uh, if you actually get that board wipe, so this is one card that you actually have to be very careful of. Because it is a mass board wipe that keeps their monster alive. So for the remaining TCG exclusives, we have the FAs. The FAs are actually gaining quite a few notable cards here. They're quite fun, actually. Now we start off with FA Dark Dragster. He's like the Asian driver of the circuit, and you just don't want to see this. He's got Tokyo Drift up your alley here. So he can be first be special summoned by having a level 7 or higher FA monster on the field, but 
you can't have a dark dragster in the in the uh, monster zone. Gains attack, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But uh, see, why he's the bad driver is that every time he shows up, a monster blows up. Once per turn, target one monster on the field. Reduce this card's level by three. And if you do, destroy that target. So he's literally just there to crash onto people. I was like, ah, boom! Oh, such a bad driver. Oh my god. Now we have to exchange our social security information. Oh my god. Okay, that was a very terrible accent, but you guys kind of get the idea where this card is coming from. So this is one of their new monsters in the line. It is like the opposite of their other notable monster, Don Dragster. This is the, uh, the hero of the race, Go Speed Racer. Uh, what does he do? He actually is a very good generic synchro monster, to be honest, because what he offers is the negation of a spell, trap, or effect by reducing this card's level by two. So in general, uh, this is only once per turn and only when your opponent activates a card effect, which is okay, which is most of the time anyway. But uh, reduce the card's level by two, and you can negate a spell tr or trap card or effect. The or effect is a spell or trap effect, so it's not like monster effects or anything, but overall it's still a pretty good card. Stat-wise, it will be at 2100 by uh, when you make it, So and it's generic too, so it just gives everyone access. When you make a level seven, you have a spell trap a negation available. Overall, you know, not too bad. And if you do, you actually destroy that card. Okay, I gotta stop with the accents. And now to get their alternative win condition, which is FA winners. If you do manage to banish three of the field spells in FAs, you will be able to win the game through this card effect. And if you do control an FA monster, this card cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. So it's uh, quite sticky. As an alternative win condition, I think this is probably one of the more feasible ones. But uh, would you rather just kill your opponent and put them under like a crap ton of locks? Or would you rather, you know, win the race? Every single one you banish is basically a trophy that you earn. And once you banish your three trophies, you're good to go. Your city circuit, your off-road circuit, and your what other circuit is there? Uh, circuit series, I don't know. Now, Dead Heat is okay. I guess they're getting traps now. Dead Heat is a pretty good one. It kind of reminds me of that Gradle trap. Uh, when your opponent declares it on direct attack, you know, your Asian driving car will now show up. And all of a sudden, you summon an FA monster from your deck. And it's any of them, so it doesn't even care about whether or not it's a tribute kind of monster. Which is okay. You know what? I can accept that. And uh, if your monster is weaker, you can force them to roll a die. And uh, if your battling monster is higher than your opponent, then uh, you get to increase your level by 4, so you can actually boost it. But if you're higher, then you don't really have to roll again. Because if you do lose the die roll, your monster does get popped. And the last trap card is Overheat. Overheat is just a tag out from your hand. You get the special summon an FA monster from your hand. Increases the level by three, which is all right. That's all it does. So, you know, don't be too surprised if this isn't exactly too useful. But it does let you recycle one of your field spells from the graveyard and put it right back onto the field. Or you put one of your ones in your hand and onto the field. So you can actually change up the level of protection. If you guys don't know what FA spells do uh, for the field spell, they offer protection. They perhaps give you advantage when you attack. Stuff like that. You can draw. I believe you can pop stuff. That's all I really know about this archetype, aside from this driver, you know, spinning out of control and crashing into your game and basically rooting your opponent, hopefully crashing on your opponent specifically. But that's all I got for this uh, segment here. There is still a part three. Part three will cover all the underrated cards and will go through all their card effects as well as the other archetypes that got minor updates 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 so stay tuned for that if you guys enjoyed this video hit me up with a thumbs up if you guys want to see more stuff from msd.tv like the part three and don't forget to check out part one hit that subscribe button we really love all of you guys for hitting that button because show tom some love as well and as always don't forget to hold on to your msd.tv before my battery runs out Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please drop us a like so we know we are doing a good job. And you can also subscribe to MSD.TV for more fantastic videos by clicking on the button on the left. Don't forget to check out our partners at Imperium Duelist. They make really high quality mats, including some of my own limited edition release stuff. And if you want to check out one of our past videos, click here on the right. As always, don't forget to hold on to your MSD.TV and I'll see you next time.